Next Vice President of the United States of America, Tim Kaye. Hey guys, how about your mayor? Give it up for Lauren. All right, I'm going to do this, right? Thank you, Mr. Mayor, for all your great service. Thank you. Now, now backstage, I got to admit, they had to teach me the chomp be, because I was doing it wrong because I'm left-handed. And they said, no, that, no, you got to turn it over. I said, are there no left-handed gators? Come on. I'm sure there's a gator. You know, okay, we got some left-handed gators. But again, I really want to thank your mayor. Mayor is a tough, tough job. Um, I'm one of 29 people in the history of the United States who has been a mayor, governor, and United States senator. Only 29. And when, when I heard that, somebody told me that was the case. I said, I said, well, that can't be so. So many governors go on to be senators. Why would there only be 29? The Senate historian checked it out, came back to me and said, there's only been 29. And then I realized why. Being mayor will kill you. Um, being mayor has got to be just about the hardest job, but probably the best. Again, Gainesville Zone, give it up for Mayor Pope. It is so great to be here, man. I've always wanted to come to this campus. I have always wanted to come to this campus, so here I am. I've really always wanted to come to the world's largest outdoor cocktail party, which I understand. Is that next weekend? All right. All right. Well, it is great to be here as we are 16 days and counting toward a historic election. I'm here with some other great friends, Cheryl Eddy, who's the president of the local Democratic Women's Club. Give her a big round of applause. And then uh, Rosalie Benjapadai, who's the second vice president of the Women's Club. So Rosie and Cheryl are out here somewhere. <clears throat> And then my, my dear friend who's spoken to you already, Senator Bill Nelson, who is just a great, great public servant. I, I have been in the Senate for about four years, and um, I came right in and I got assigned to be on the Armed Services Committee with your Senator Bill Nelson. I knew him by reputation. We've got some mutual friends in, uh, in Virginia, but he and Grace have become very dear friends of, of Ann and mine, and I just think you are so lucky Florida, but also the nation is really lucky to have Bill in service. So give Bill another big round of applause. I am, I am really happy to be here. This is an early vote rally, because what day does early vote starting right here in Gainesville? Tomorrow, absolutely. And we're going across the country to early voting states to make sure people understand how important this election is, but also how important it is to early vote. If you can uh, get out a little bit early and then start to bank those votes, um, A, it makes it more convenient for people to have more options in terms of the time, but it also makes the organizing task so much easier if you know, wow, good save. Give them a round of applause, good save. We are stronger together, we are stronger together. It makes it so much easier if you bank those votes early. So why don't you do this? Raise your hand if you are already volunteering to help and give all the volunteers a big round of applause, right? I see students, I see AFT members and other members from labor. I see a lot of great volunteers. If you still have time and would like to volunteer, it gets really important right here as you're at the end and you're doing an early vote. So all you've got to do is text TOGETHER to 47246. And if you do that, they will sweep you up and include you in this volunteer effort because I'll tell you the reason I'm here and the reason Bill Clinton is in South Florida today and the reason my wife was here last week and the reason the president has been here and Michelle Obama has been here and Hillary Clinton's here and is going to be back is because you guys are absolutely rock solid critical to this election. If you put electoral votes behind the Clinton Kane ticket, it's over, we're going to win and you will have done it. I don't, I don't know if you noticed, I don't smoke three packs a day. My voice is shot at the end of the campaign. I'm, I'm feeling great. I love campaigning, but, but my voice has run out about two and a half weeks before my energy has run out. So uh, it doesn't hurt or anything, but this is not normally what I sound like. It, um, 
it really is fun to come. We do a lot of rallies on college campuses because we're trying to communicate with everybody, but we know how important the student vote is, how important the millennial vote is. Um, let's face it, this thing's going to be close in Florida. Um, I, I, I think you guys should change your name from the Sunshine State to the to the super close election state. Um, I sometimes feel in Florida, wait, are you guys just toying with us? It just seems like every presidential election, you start with 50 states, and that's how you start. And then, you know, some are really red and some are really blue. Then you whittle it down to maybe 12 or 13 states that are battleground states. And then you whittle it down even further within the battleground states. Virginia is a battleground. My, my home state of Virginia, I see a Virginia Tech shirt over here somewhere. All right, go Hokies. Go Hokies. Um, you whittle it down, you whittle it down, you whittle it down, and you even get to fewer states that are what I call the checkmate states. The checkmate state is a state that the other side, if they don't win it, they can't find the path to the White House. Florida is one of those states. Pennsylvania is one of those states. North Carolina, Ohio, there's probably four this cycle that are just absolute checkmate states. And the reason that that's important, and then I want to talk about a couple of issues, but just to put it this way, if you live in a checkmate state, you know, you don't have to wait up till central time or mountain time or Pacific time to know who the President of the United States is. You, you can just do the work you need to do right here. And if you can produce that win for Hillary right here, you can pretty much take it to the bank that she's going to be president. So now that is that's exciting. But it, it ought to put a little bit of pressure on your shoulders, right? You, when you are key to it, that means you got to do your best work. We know the kind of work you can do, and uh, we're excited to be here with you. Um, I wanted to talk about a couple of things. I wanted to talk about the debate for a second, then about why Hillary and I are doing this, and then about kind of Donald Trump's vision on the other side, and the last thing, how we win. So let's start with the debate. Wasn't Hillary fantastic in those three debates? I mean, she was... She was so fantastic in these three debates. Um, you know, it was, yeah, you know, I did all right. I did all right. I, I, I had a good time. I was, I had kind of a feisty debate, but that's, you know, nothing, nothing wrong with feisty. It's like, the, it's like the, around the kitchen table at my house. Um, but Hillary was so good. There were so many great moments in those debates. Um, one of my favorite moments was in her first debate at the end when, Donald Trump got confronted with something negative he'd said about Hillary. I think it was, what did you mean when you said she doesn't look very presidential, does she, fellas? And he tried to say, well, I wasn't, oh, and Lester Holt said, was that about her gender? Was that about her looks? And he said, no, 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 I was talking about her stamina. Well, then Hillary, she had a great answer. So there's a split screen. You can see them both in a split screen, and Hillary says, well, you go to 120 countries, and you testify before Congress for 11 hours, then you can talk to me about stamina. And, and uh, when, when she was doing that on the split screen, she was just stand up ramrod straight. If the moderator had said, hey, let's extend this debate, let's do another five or six hours worth, she would have said, fine, let's go. But Donald, on the other hand, was kind of leaning sideways, kind of like he was looking for a lamppost to lean up against. He was the guy that had run out of gas. And that showed itself during the course of the debates. Um, another great moment uh, was, not great, but shocking, in the last debate was uh, Donald Trump saying that he didn't know whether he would abide by the results of the election. I mean, there's a word for that. It's called sore loser. Um, sore loser. But it, but it, it is also kind of not a laughing matter. I, I was a missionary in Honduras 35 years ago, 1980, 81. Tenemos hondureños aquí. Tenemos algunos hondureños. When I was there, when I was there, Si se puede, si se puede. When, when I was in Honduras, it was a military dictatorship, and nobody could vote for anything. And the people that I knew prayed for the day when there would be elections and the results would be respected and there would be a peaceful transfer of power. I had never lived in a society like that before. I took voting for granted. Of course, you're going to respect an election and have a transfer of power. That's what we do in this country, but it turns out it's not so common. It's, it's kind of rare in some countries in the world. People have never experienced it. They don't know what that's like. It's one of the central pillars of American democracy. 
So when Donald Trump decides to attack that, you know, what I thought when I heard him say it was this. Here's a guy who's run a divisive campaign from the very beginning. He ran his first, in his first campaign speech, he said Mexican immigrants were rapists and criminals. He's attacked women. He's attacked Muslims. He's attacked LGBT Americans. He's attacked African Americans. He's ridiculed a disabled reporter. He attacked John McCain. John McCain said you can't be a hero because you were a POW. That you, you can only be a hero if they don't capture you. He, he, went after, he went after a Virginia family, the Kahn family, who, have a, who are a gold star family. They lost their son, who was trying to save other people's lives in Iraq, and Donald Trump went after them. And it was like he got to the end of the campaign, and he had insulted every group that he could. What was left to insult? I know I will insult the central pillar of American democracy, that we know how to run elections, and that we know how, a, how to have a peaceful transfer of power. Uh, a president who won't defend our democratic institutions and traditions, well, it, it, that person is not worthy, that's the, not worthy to be president. And that was a powerful moment the other night. <clears throat> and then, and then he, uh, the other thing that was odd when you put it together, he was, there's a lot of discussion about Russia. It, there is rock solid evidence that the government of Russia is trying to destabilize the American election, to influence the outcome of the election. This is unprecedented in the history of our country that this is going on. And Donald Trump has received the same intelligence briefings I have. I get him as VP, he gets him as a presidential candidate. The candidates get them. And much of this has been made public, so I'm not revealing anything that I'll regret later. Um, but Donald's gotten the same briefings I have about the Russian effort to influence the outcome of the election. But again and again, when that came up, he kept saying, we have no knowledge that it's Russia. It could be anybody. One debate, he said it could be a 400-pound kid in a basement. Then the other night, he said it could be China. We have no evidence that it's Russia. He wouldn't acknowledge what our own intelligence officials are telling him. So put those two facts together. He won't defend American Democratic traditions, he won't condemn a foreign nation that's trying to influence and destabilize an American election. There's something very, very weird about that. Very weird. And then the last thing about the debate, and really since the debate, is the way Donald has been going around saying that the election will be rigged. Um, and again, that's the sore loser thing. If you know you're losing and you think you're going to lose, then you've got to have an excuse because, Lord forbid, you could never take responsibility for it yourself. I mean, you know that the day after the election, if Donald Trump loses, he's not going to say, maybe I shouldn't have run the most divisive campaign in modern history. Huh, there's a lesson for next time. I don't, I don't think he's going to do any soul searching and reach any conclusions or take any responsibility, so it's got to be somebody else's fault. And that's the pattern that he has. Hillary dinged him on it the other night um, because when he, when The Apprentice one year was up for an Emmy and lost, he said, the whole thing is rigged. Poor Donald Trump, the billionaire that the world has decided to rig it all against him. It's always got to be somebody else's fault. Well, the good news is this. People aren't buying it. Republicans, Republican leaders, much less Democrats all over the country, are stepping forward and saying, hold on a second. We know how to run elections. Most states have Republican secretaries of the electoral board or secretaries of state that run elections. They're coming out and saying this election is going to be fair. But if you needed just one more reason to turn out and vote, in addition to the differences between the candidates, let's take all this claim about rigging and sore loser stuff, and let's turn out in record numbers and send the biggest, clearest message that we can about what this nation embraces and what this nation rejects. And you know, if we turn out in big numbers, we also have a great chance to elect a better Congress that's going to work with Hillary Clinton. And Patrick Murphy, I'll tell you, will be a great U.S. Senator and turn out to help him and support him strongly. <clears throat> Let me tell you why, why Hillary and I are in this race. Sometimes those of us in politics, I think we make it about the policy positions. Policy is important. You know, the position on climate change, position on college affordability, position on 
student loan debt, position on LGBT equality, these are all very important. But I think it's also important to share why we do it. It's not just a laundry list of 10 or 15 things. Why do we do it? Let me tell you what Hillary said to me when she called me three, week, three months ago last night at 7.32 p.m. to ask me if I would be on her ticket. <laughs> not, not that it was a memorable phone call for me. You know, not that it was an unusual event in my life. <laughs> Hillary said this. She said, look, you've been a city councilman and a mayor and a lieutenant governor, governor and senator, and you were a missionary, and you were a civil rights lawyer. You've had a lot of life experiences. Um, but here's what she said that really tells you about her. She said, I want our administration, if we're successful, to be measured not by a bill, not by a headline, not by a sound bite, but by whether a family can better afford to send their kid to college, or whether a schoolroom is a better learning environment for a teacher or a child, or whether a small business can hire a few more people, or, <clears throat> or a worker can get a few more skills, or a family can afford health care. I want it to be measured by the practical difference we can make in somebody's life. And she said, I think because you've done a lot of different things, as we're sitting around the table together hashing out what we're going to do, you'll remind us how we ought to measure what we do. We ought to measure it by the practical effect that we have in people's lives. And that's what sort of I've done in my public service career, and that's what Hillary's done in a really, really remarkable way. Let me talk about a couple of the areas where we're going to focus and focus strong right out of the gate, and then do a little contrast with Donald Trump and then finish with how we're going to win. Um, first, we really are focused, and your mayor talked about this, about the way to grow the economy in a way that really works for everybody. We can't have an economy that's just working for people at the top. And even if the GDP is growing, if a whole lot of people don't see any of that growth as something that they can access, well, you know, it's, it's not working. It, it's got to be an economy that works for everybody. Let me, let me give President Obama his props, but let me tell you what he would say if he were here. President Obama came in in the worst recession since the 1930s, and with no help from the GOP in Congress, we have added 15 million private sector jobs. We've cut the unemployment rate in half. People's <clears throat> 401k, people's 401k retirement policies are worth something again. And between 2014 and 2015, we had the biggest jump ever of people moving from poverty up into the middle class, the biggest jump in any single year ever. So President Obama hasn't got enough credit for that, but if he were here, what he would say is, but we clearly have got a long way to go. We clearly haven't done enough because there are a lot of people, and I bet everybody here knows them. Maybe family or friends or relatives are in your community. There's a lot of people who uh, they don't yet see the ladder of success that they can climb. There may be an unemployment rate coming down, and wages may be going up, and, uh, and yet, maybe because of the zip code you live in, maybe because of the family you were born into, maybe because of the industry you were trained up in, you don't see the ladder that you can climb. And if you don't see that, or even worse, if you don't see the ladder for your own children to climb to success, that's a bitter thing. And that explains a lot of the economic anxiety out there. Well, Hillary and I have a pretty simple plan. We want to make major investments in jobs. Your mayor talked about it, infrastructure, clean energy, manufacturing. We're going to do that right out of the gate, working with a bipartisan Congress. We want to do all kinds of things in the education space. I'm going to talk about college in a minute, but pre-K education, celebrating great teachers, career and technical education, so that our workforce will have the best skills they can have. We want to have policies that are about wages. Raise the minimum wage so that if you can't work minimum wage and be below the poverty level, <clears throat> there's something wrong with that. There's something wrong with it. If you say in this country, and we do, that hard work is important, that's the key, work hard, but you have policies where if you do work at a minimum wage job, and 65% of people who do are women, and you work full time and you have one dependent, you will be below the poverty level. What does that mean when we tell people hard work is important, hard work is important, hard work is important? We have a policy where you do work hard and you're under the poverty level. It means that the words that we say, we don't really mean them. If work is important and if we value it, we ought to have policies that make sure that work is dignified and you can earn a living wage to support a family if you're working full time. So whether it's raising the minimum wage, 
raising the minimum wage or equal pay for women, for gosh sake, it's 2016, right? We gotta do that. And then, and then the fourth thing we wanna do is really focus on small businesses and startups. Gainesville's a good community for this. Richmond's a good community for this. 65% of new jobs in this country come from startup and small businesses. And so if we have to have policies that are really focused on jobs, let's make it easier to start a small business, to get the capital to grow a small business, to hire employees into a small business, to buy health insurance for your employees if you're running a small business. And this is what Hillary and I are gonna do. And the difference is pretty astounding. The independent analysts have looked at the Clinton plan and the Trump plan and they've said, if you put the Clinton plan in place, by the end of the first four years, we will have grown 10 and a half million jobs. 10 and a half million more jobs on top net of what we've done. But the Trump plan put into effect would reduce jobs by three and a half million. So the difference between a Clinton plan and a Trump plan is 14 million jobs. And I've been describing that as the difference between a you're hired president and a you're fired president. Why wouldn't we, why wouldn't we want a you're hired president? <clears throat> Second. I don't know about you, but I'm really worried about climate change. I'm very worried about it. Um, F F Florida and Virginia have some similarities because we're both seeing the effects of sea level rise. The um, Hampton Roads area in Virginia Beach, Norfolk, Chesapeake, Suffolk, um, the Virginia Beach area, Newport News, other communities, second only to New Orleans in the effect of sea level rise today. We're not talking about a tomorrow issue, we're talking about today. And neighborhoods where you could sell a house 10 years ago, it's hard to sell the house now. It affects businesses, it affects Navy operations, and we're seeing it in a very dramatic way. Just as South Florida especially, just we're not even talking about storms, that, that makes it worse, but just normal tidal action uh, and sea level rise is creating a huge challenge. Hillary and I, we're on a university campus. We believe in science. I mean, is that so complicated? <clears throat> our, our, our scientists tell us that human-produced CO2 emissions are changing the climate and we better do something about it. You know, there are other things that are contributing, but human causes is very, very significant. We have to do something about it. Donald Trump says climate change is a hoax created by the Chinese. That is a direct quote. Mike Pence, his running mate, says it's a myth. I don't know if you guys know about 12-step programs, but step one is always, you've got to admit you have a problem. But they, they, you, you can't solve a problem, you can't lick a problem if you're refusing to acknowledge you have a problem. That's the problem with the other guys. So on this one, and I think especially with millennials, I have three 20-somethings, I've got an infantry commander in the Marine Corps and two artists. Um, they, especially, they, they all care deeply about this, but especially my artists who don't care about any other issue in, in politics, they're like, Dad, what are you doing about climate change? And it makes sense if you're living your 20s and 30s and you're projecting forward and you're probably gonna life expectancy to 90 or 100 if you're this age right now, you wanna make sure that the planet is one you can live on and that you can hand to your own kids and grandkids. We need to be stewards of this beautiful and diverse planet and Hillary and I will do that. Very, very important issue. Very important issue. I, um, I was a civil rights lawyer. Equality matters a lot to me. It matters a lot to me. For 17 years, I battled in Richmond against people who were discriminating against folks in housing, mostly because of the color of their skin, sometimes because of their disability or national origin. I just think one of the greatest things about this country, and there's many great things about this country, is that when, now forgive me for being kind of a Virginia-centric person, being a senator from Virginia and all, but when they were drafting the Declaration of Independence in the Constitution, people like Jefferson and Madison said, we're gonna put equality first. All men are created equal. Now, we know something about them. They put equality out as the North Star, but they weren't living equal. They really couldn't even completely conceive of it because all men are created equal, right? So that, that's, that's a sentence that right in the sentences contains like this kind of cognitive dissonance. But the good news about those folks was even they were very flawed, at least they picked the right value. 
I don't know that there's another nation that says that is the value. Equality is our North Star. That's who we are. That's who this country is. <clears throat> and um, and you guys, you guys know our history. One way to look at our history, it's all been about that. It's all been about that. Every generation wakes up and says, "Wow, this is who we promised we would be." But slavery? I mean, how how can you match these up? And so bloodshed. Civil War rewriting the Constitution to make ourselves a little more like who we promised we would be. And then 50 years later, this is who we said we were going to be. But women can't even have the right to vote? I mean, how can we? So then we changed the Constitution before. Get to the mid-60s. This is who we said we would be. But there's all kinds of rules that keep minorities from voting or housing or employment. So we got to pass civil rights acts to make sure that people are equal so we can live more like we said we would, like we said we would. Your generation, it's, it's been your generation that helped the nation wake up and say, hey, this is who we said we would be, but LGBT folks are not being treated equally. We got to have marriage equality, and we got to treat everybody. I mean, it's just equal, you know, the word is equal. And we got to live equal. And now there's new challenges. Criminal justice reform, so important in our cities, so important in our cities. Because why, <clears throat> why do we over-incarcerate compared to other nations? And why are the stats of our incarceration so skewed against minorities? There's an equality issue that we have to tackle. We got to make sure. <clears throat> We got to make sure that we keep moving forward on LGBT equality. Donald Trump and Mike Pence, they want to put Supreme Court justices in who will go backwards. In Honduras, we used to say, adelante no atrás. I want to go forward. I do not want to go back. We're not going back on equality issues for LGBT Americans. Um, basic, basic rights for women. Right? I mean, shouldn't women get equal pay for equal work? We said it was about equality. <clears throat> shouldn't women get to make their own health care decisions and choices just like men do? We said it was about equality. We said it was about equality. And then voting rights, still so important. Uh, the nation's history was, you know, okay, you could vote if you're a white male and own property, then a white male, even non-property owner. And then we said African American, we couldn't restrict African Americans from voting in the 15th Amendment just because of the color of their skin, although we put up all kinds of other barriers. Then we let women vote. Then we let 18-year-olds vote. We switched the voting age from 21 to 18 uh, under the Nixon administration. We've been expanding the opportunity for people to vote. But in recent years, really, it's kind of been in the age of Obama for some reason. In states all around this country, there have been these efforts to now kind of narrow it down. You got to have more IDs. We're going to reduce the number of days you can early vote. No, we believe deeply, Hillary and I, that a society that participates at the max is truly what a democracy is. We want to make voter registration automatic on your 18th birthday. <clears throat> and expand, expand early vote and make it more convenient. So on equality issues, this is something that we're battling for and that you support. I said I'd talk about college, and the mayor talked about it a little bit too. The cost of college is, is putting it out of the reach of so many people. I, I went to college just at the right time. I went to the University of Missouri, uh, a fellow a member of the amazing SEC. Um, <laughs> Now, and I, I went just at the right time. What was happening with college is the cost of college was going up just about the same as wages were going up until about 1985. I got out of law school in 1983. I finished just in time. Then about 85, it just started to go like this. Wages were going up like this, but the cost of college was going up like that. And so many families find it really hard to afford college. And now student loan debt is bigger than credit card debt in this country. Hillary and I have a pretty simple point of view. You should not have to mortgage your future to have a future. You shouldn't have to mortgage your future to have a future. <clears throat> and so we want to do three things. First, we want to make a commitment to debt-free college. Not free for everybody, but debt-free. Other societies do that, uh, and they have less resources than we do. They make it a priority because they know that the education will advance uh, people and advance the economy too. So that's goal one, debt-free college. Goal two 
if your family makes less than $125,000 a year, we want to make it tuition free at an in-state level. So have to pay room and board, but tuition free, that would be very, very important. And then the third thing, that's not going to help those of us who are already out and dealing with debt. And the debt is sky high. So what are we going to do about debt? We need to make it easier to refinance your debt and bring the monthly payment down to something that you can afford without it getting in the way of everything else that you have to do in your life. Here's something weird about our society. It is easier to refinance a debt on a yacht, on a private jet, on a vacation home than it is to refinance student loan debt. Makes absolutely no sense. And so we need to make it easier to refinance, and we will. Um, one, one, la one last issue before I maybe want to uh, focus. Well, I, I, I've been doing a comparison with Donald Trump along the way. And while I'm on that subject, uh, on college, you know, the only thing Donald is known for when it comes to college is Trump you. <laughs> Trump you. Now, think about what that means. You know, there's these fraud suits going on against this college that he started. But Hillary Clinton and me, I was a mayor and governor. Education's the biggest part of my budget in both my city and my state. I work on education issues in the Senate. Donald, I mean, Hillary and me, we look at education as this is the way for an individual to have a great opportunity, but it's also a way for the entire society and the entire economy to do better. So good for the individual, good for society. That's why you invest in education. Donald looked at education and he saw something very different. And what he saw was, wow, this is an opportunity for me to make a whole lot of money by putting together this non-accredited Trump U, by having a whole lot of slick marketing material, by hiring teachers and instructing them, here's how you get more money out of the students. Tell them to max out their credit cards. Oh, well, go to veterans. They get GI Bill benefits. You can get a lot of veterans in the net and in the snare and then get those monies. Go to veterans' widows. They get GI Bill benefits. You can get them and get the money and get them in your snare. And tens of thousands of people across this country who hoped that they could get something that would help them have a better life put their money and their trust in Donald Trump and found out that they were ripped off. And that's why these fraud suits are going on anywhere. I mean, education is so important. I think it's important that we have a president who understands that education is about lifting and leveling individuals in society and not somebody who looks at education as just a big money-making opportunity or even a scam. That is a clear difference between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. <clears throat> One last issue and then how are we going to win? I want to talk about taxes. I want to talk about taxes. Um, Hillary and I have a pretty simple strategy on taxes. We will guarantee if you're making less than $250,000 a year, no tax rate increases, and there will be targeted tax relief for things like child care and other important things that will bring down taxes for millions of Americans, and we will target tax relief to these small and startup businesses that I talked about earlier. So it will be easier to start and grow and add employees. That's our tax plan. Donald Trump has a different tax plan. Hillary says he's very sincere about this. He really believes this will work. You give trillions of dollars of tax cuts to those at the very top. And in the first debate, Hillary challenged him on that. That's, that's just like a big giveaway. That won't work. And Donald, the way he answered it, he even kind of made a really cool hand gesture. I call it kind of an abracadabra hand gesture. He said, no, you're wrong, because if you give tax cuts at the top, then all of a sudden, they'll create all kinds of jobs for everybody else. You know, it's just not true. We tried that in the early 2000s, and it tanked the economy. It put us into the worst recession since the 1930s. It, it exploded the debt and deficit and continues to do so. So why would you put something in place that's already been proven to be a failure that will explode the deficit? Well, the answer that I think is pretty obvious is that tax plan may not work for the country, but it's a tax plan that is kind of designed to work for people just like Donald Trump. If he would ever release his tax returns, you could, you could lay his own tax return against his tax plan and see, wow, I now can see the logic of this plan that you've put on the table. It makes perfect sense if you look at your tax return and the tax plan. But that's why he won't do it. And you saw Hillary challenge him on stage in the first debate. Hey, you're not producing your tax return. This was really interesting, really interesting. 
She said, you're not doing it because you're hiding something. Maybe you're hiding that you're not that wealthy. Donald didn't say anything. Maybe you're hiding that your tax plan really benefits you. Didn't say anything. Maybe you're hiding that you're not that charitable. He didn't say anything. But then she hit a nerve. Maybe you're hiding that you're not paying any taxes. And Donald Trump could not keep his mouth zipped. And instead, he just leaned into the mic and said, yeah, that shows I'm smart. That shows I'm smart. I'm not paying any taxes. Now, I'll tell you what I think about that. My wife, Ann, and I, our oldest boy, is in the Marine Corps. He's deployed overseas for the second time. And there's 2 million young men and women just like him who volunteer in a time of war to be an active guard or reserve. And because they volunteer, we don't have to serve. About 1% of the adult population volunteers to serve in the military. And the deal kind of is, we will have a volunteer military. We will not have a draft. It will be volunteer. And 1%, 1% will volunteer. But there is some obligation on the shoulders of the 99% who don't have to volunteer, who don't have to risk their lives in that way, to at least provide some support. Nobody loves paying taxes, but if you think our 1% are worthy of support, then that's one of the reasons you pay taxes. Or if you think, if you think veterans who have served, who are going to VA hospitals, are entitled to be served because of what they did, that's why you pay taxes. Or if you think the Pell Grant program that helps students be able to afford college if their families can't is good for society, then you're going to pay some taxes. Or how about teachers? Do teachers do a good job? Do we need teachers in this society? You're going to pay some taxes. So when Donald Trump says, hey, look, I don't pay taxes and that makes me smart, he's saying the rest of us are stupid. He's saying we're stupid to go to work and, and support our vets and support our troops and support our teachers and support Pell Grants and write out taxes. I can tell you something. I, I can think of a lot of words for what Donald Trump is doing, and I'm not going to say any of those words, but I'm going to tell you this, that smart, smart is not one of the words that I think of. We can't allow that to go unchallenged. We can't. All right, well, let me, let me just close and tell you how we're going to win. Early voting starts tomorrow, and I've already said, let's just turn out early, let's volunteer, let's go wild. Florida, you guys do it, and we're going to win this race. But um, here's the way we have to think about this. I feel good about the polls right now, looking at Florida polls, talking to my friend Bill Nelson, who's a real expert, looking at other polls. I feel good, but what I want to say as I close is we can't take anything for granted. We can't take anything for granted. We, we, um, <clears throat> We can't take anything for granted because, hey, we were ahead on Labor Day, but by September 26th, the polls had completely closed. So if they've closed once, they can do it again. We can't take anything for, we can't take anything for granted because this has been a season of surprises. Polls have been wrong. Pundits have been wrong. The GOP nominated somebody. Most of us thought that they wouldn't nominate. It's been a season of surprises, so you can't take anything for granted. We can't take anything for granted because for the first time in modern history, a foreign nation is engaged in cyber efforts to destabilize and influence an electoral outcome. We got to turn out big to show any other country, don't think you can mess with an American election. We're not going to let you do it. We can't take anything for granted. We can't take anything for granted because Donald Trump is setting it up to whine that it was all rigged, but if we win big, he can still whine, but nobody will believe him. We can't take anything for granted. We can't take anything for granted because if we are able to win big, we'll bring in more members of the House and the Senate who will help Hillary do the things I was just describing and move this nation forward. We can't take anything for granted. And, and the last reason is the one that in some ways motivates me the most. We can't take anything for granted because Hillary Clinton's trying to do something that nobody has ever done. I mean, if it had been easy for there to be a woman president, there would have been a woman president. You know, here's a fact about our country. We, we all know that Hillary would make history as the first woman president, but here's something you may not know, and it, was, it surprised me when I heard it. Congress right now is 19% women. That's the most ever, ever we've been in our history, and that ranks 75th in the world. If you look at every nation with a national legislative body and you look at the percentage of women, we're 75th at 19%. Iraq, 26%. 
Afghanistan, 28%. Rwanda is number one, about 65%. We are so good at so many things in this country, and we're entitled to pat ourselves on the back on the things we're good at. But part of being a great nation is also looking in the mirror and saying, but hey, here's some things that we're not good at. We are not good, and we've never been good at electing women to federal office in this country. We've never been good. <clears throat> and so that tells us you can't take anything for granted. I'll tell you something good about me and bad about me. I am 8-0 and in elections, and I'm going to be 9-0 and on November 8th. I don't lose. I don't lose. I do not lose. You can, hey, you can beat me at Scrabble. You can beat me at Trivial Pursuit. You can beat me at a trivia contest. You're not going to beat me in an election. And, and Hillary, you know, added, added me to the ticket. She said partly because, you know, this guy's kind of a rabbit's foot in a way. He, he can help us win. Now, that was the good news. The bad news is I barely win my elections. I mean, my, I, I give my friends such heartburn and, uh, and anxiety come elections. And the reason I barely win is because Virginia's a tough place. We're not the bluest state in the bunch. In fact, we were really, really red, and we've gotten a little bluer more recently. But the thing that I do to win elections in a tough state, when I feel like there's a headwind coming at me, is I do this thing in my head, and I want to encourage you to do that for the next 16 days. I'm the underdog until they call me the winner. I am the underdog until they call me the winner. And if we, if we organize and volunteer and knock on doors and make phone calls with that in our head, we're trying to make history. It's hard. I'm the underdog until they call me the winner. I know that's the way Hillary thinks. Um, and I like that because it's not just about elections. It's also a little bit about life. You know, I think, I don't know all of you, but if you're here for Hillary, if you're here for this race, if you're kind of lean a little bit on the Democratic side, you're underdog people. I do know that about you. We kind of have a sympathy for the underdog. Um, I, I was Democratic Party chair. I used to travel all across the country, and Democrats are so different all across the country, but that was kind of a unifier. We're underdog people. In my church, we would talk about a Good Samaritan type story. There's somebody beaten up, laying at the side of the road, and a whole lot of people just walk on by. They just walk on by. People who were leaders, people who were religious leaders, people who should have known better, they just walked on by. Um, there's probably somebody who walked on by and said, you're a loser, you know, probably when they walked on by in that story. And then a Samaritan who in that story was sort of a despised minority religion said, I'm not walking on by. I'm going to go over and help out. Hillary Clinton is the kind of person who will never just walk on by. I'll tell you that. I know that about her. I'm not going to walk on by. I don't think you are going to just walk on by because this we know. In America 2016, in the world 2016, there's a lot of people lying at the side of the road. Some are victims of violence, just like the person in that story, but some just need a job or they need to afford college or they're struggling with health care costs. Their business may be about to go under. They're an LGBT kid in a high school and they're getting bullied and they don't know, you know, where to go for help. There's somebody who made a mistake when they were young and they're just looking for a second chance. There's a lot of people at the side of the road and they're calling out to us, you know, hey, I just, can you just come over and help us out? We don't have to know all the answers. We don't even have to know the right words to say because often we don't, but all we have to be willing to do is just roll off our sleeves and not walk on by and just go over and help out. Folks, that's what this comes down to. Hillary, for 40 years, has put making families and kids successful at the center of her life. She's been walking on over and helping out again and again and again. And Donald Trump is a guy who's been putting himself first. And when you put yourself first, you're going to be deaf to that cry, and you're not going to want to go over and help out. That is fundamentally what's at issue in this race. We ought to have a president with a compassionate heart and a strong backbone and a great listening ear. And if we do what we know how to do here in Florida, in Virginia, and elsewhere, we can all celebrate making history the night of November 8th and electing Hillary Clinton our next president. <clears throat> Thank you, guys, Gainesville. I finally made it to the University of Florida. I'm so excited. Let's go win. Thanks so much.